Dot. Hello everybody and welcome back to Tip Tart and welcome back to Basics for Beginners. Wow, it's been a little while since we've done a video in this series, but that's okay because this time we're going to dive headfirst into quite a big subject. Gestalt principles, basics for beginners. Gestalt principles uh, are, well, gestalt is a psychology term. Um, it hypothesizes that people tend to organize elements into groups. Um, so you look at a design that someone has made. And rather than seeing the individual elements and make it up, you see um, the relationships between them uh, when certain principles are applied. What this means is um, if you saw, for example, two circles of the same color um, and the same size placed next to each other, you'd perceive them as having a relationship rather than as two separate circles. Um, it literally translates to unified whole and it's sort of a German psychologist theory developed in the 1920s. Um, this will make sense as we go through, but essentially some general rules that you need to understand are as follows. So objects will be perceived in their simplest form. So we've talked um, about um, how we perceive relationships between objects. Um, that is what Gestalt theory is about. Um, the relationships that different objects or elements of a design have with each other. The first rule is that we perceive them in their simplest form. So if you take these Olympic rings down on the bottom left, we perceive this as five interlocking different colored circles rather than what it physically is, which is a blue curved line that is then split by a yellow curved line, which is then split by. So we don't see these as individual shapes. We don't perceive this section of the blue circle as one element and this section of the yellow circle as an element and then the rest of this is another element and then this black section, no. We perceive it in its simplest form which is five circles that are interlocking. Although technically that can't be the case because it's just a 2D picture. You may hear my cat attacking her food tower in the background as usual. Secondly, humans naturally follow lines or curves. Now, an odd example, but I find quite a useful one, is if you drive um, and you approach a roundabout, there are guided lines to help you pick a lane. Um, sorry for those who don't live in the UK, roundabouts are less common in the US, but bear with me. Um, on a roundabout, there is a uh, guideline or guidelines that run around the um, perimeter of the roundabout. Although these are technically separate shapes, that should have no relationship to each other. By human nature, we perceive this line and this curve as a single element, okay? We naturally follow these lines and curves. Same for this line here, same for this line here, coming up like so. Where these two lines intersect, we perceive them as doing so, okay? We perceive this as one flowing object, this as another flowing object, even though this is technically a T-shape here, okay? We perceive these lines and curves first before we perceive any sort of right angles or harsh adjacent lines. Finally, the mind will attempt to fill in detail that isn't actually there. Now, using this example, um, may be a little bit confusing as uh, this also follows several of the other principles of um, Gestalt theory, namely closure, which is um, this gap here being filled in. But essentially all of them boil down to the fact that if there is no information there, but it is implied, our mind will subconsciously fill in the blanks. So as long as you understand that going forward, then this should be super easy for you guys. Basically, you break down to its core minimum uh, gestalt psychology, gestalt design theory um, proposes that the whole is different from the sum of its parts. Um, interesting bit of trivia. I can't remember the guy who um, first proposed gestalt theory, but he um, was really pissed off at the mistranslation. Um, there's the famous quote, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That is not the correct translation. The correct translation is the whole is something else from the sum of its parts. He got mad at this because um, it implies addition. It implies that the whole is um, something more than its individual elements, whereas his argument was it was something else entirely. It's not addition. It's just completely different. Well, so there are several principles that Gestalt theory defines. There are a few main ones, okay? And we're going to go through the main six here. Like I said, there are more. But to get yourself started, this will be plenty. Continuation, similarity, closure, proximity, symmetry, and figure and ground. We're going to dive through these one by one. And hopefully, by the end of it, you'll have a better understanding of the main principles that build up Gestalt theory. Let's start with continuation, okay? Here, in this example, the continuation consists of that 
place where the uh, letter G has been sliced in two by that gap. Excuse me. Um, with the two leaves growing out of it. Continuation essentially means um, when the eye is sort of pushed through or compelled to move through one object or element and into or through another object or element in the design, quite often used in um, typography logos. You can see here in this ProQuest logo, for example, that the um, serif on the Q, the, the, the little crossbar, sweeps out, compelling the viewer's eye downwards towards the start here portion of the logo. OK, um, often this is coupled with gaps in the text. You can see that the uh, there is a gap on the bottom of the queue here between um, this section and the serif um, just helps to emphasize this sort of swooping continuation here. Same thing for this Amazon logo, connecting the A to Z, obviously implying that they have everything you need from A to Z on Amazon. The, the tail of this A swoops down across the, the continuation, goes through and pushes up the Z, dragging your eyes along. OK, so that implies a relationship between A and Z on Amazon and a relationship between the path of this queue and the starting point of the journey for whatever ProQuest is. Here, the S is a continuation down through the USA network, but this also applies to another Gestalt principle that we're going to talk about in a minute. So it's important to note that it is no way exclusive, um, very much the opposite, in fact. Several Gestalt principles can be applied in the same design, and oftentimes, if they are, it's a more compelling and interesting design. Let's talk about closure. Closure occurs when an element is incomplete, or not totally finished or enclosed, okay? Um, but if enough of the shape is there, then the human mind will fill in what remains. Now, we've talked about this with the WWF logo. We imply, or rather the design implies, that the rest of this panda's head is here, when in fact, there is nothing. There is no design element in this place, okay? Same goes for here as well. However, because enough of it is indicated our mind fills in the rest and we perceive this as a finished shape. Same goes for this light bulb here. Clearly there is nothing going on. There's no connection between the screw and the bulb portion of the design. However, because of the implication, we perceive it to be true. We perceive a relationship between this man's gap of his hand and the screw of this light bulb. Similarly here, closure on this E, okay? Technically, this is a hyphen with a sort of T that is joined to an A here. Well, not even an A because there's a gap there, yeah? However, we know, as in the Western alphabet, that the letters E and A, and when we apply that to the company name, EA Sports or EA whatever, um, we know that this is supposed to represent an E and A. Therefore, we subconsciously fill in the remaining information and it just makes a nice little design element. USA Network, very much the same thing. This S does not exist. There is a U with a tail and an A with a preceding tail. There is no S. However, we, as people who can understand the Western alphabet, um, understand there is supposed to be an S here, though it is implied but not explicitly designed. Similarity, then. Similarity occurs when objects look the same. Simple as that, okay? The viewer will perceive them as a group or pattern, even though technically there is no other relationship between them. Can be similarities in color, shape, texture, any design element you want. This is probably the easiest to understand, but also the most broad of the Gestalt principles, okay? We can see in the NBC logo here, similarity of uh, shape between this um, peacock's feathers. However, no similarity of color, no similarity of uh, position. They're all rotated different ways, but we understand that they are related to each other. This little peacock head here actually, again, doesn't exist, a form of closure, but also a form of figure and ground, another Gestalt principle we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, similarity here, similarity of patterns between different shapes of foliage, okay? Nice and simple, you can imply a relationship based on similarity. Coupled with this is the theory of anomaly. Okay, when enough objects are similar in some kind of pattern, then you can emphasize a different object by creating an anomaly, making it different to the pattern or the similarity that you have just spent your time creating. When you do this, it's known as an anomaly and it creates emphasis, it draws the eye. You can see here this grid of green squares and a rotated blue one off to the corner. You're automatically compelled to see that blue square over the pattern. Let's talk about proximity. Proximity occurs 
when things are close to each other. Simple as that. Uh, the position of each element helps to portray the relationship between the separate parts. The opposite is also true. If there is no proximity, there is a perception of a lack of relationship between those elements. We can see these group dots here, clearly perceived as three separate elements purely by this channel that's running down through them. If these were grouped together, they'd be perceived as a single element. Perhaps this is a count of some kind, okay? Again, here, a single item, a single element of a curved man reaching over his head. You place them in proximity, sorry, you place them in proximity to each other, and it becomes this idea of a tree, purely by proximity. If these were all in a row or a circle, you get a different relationship. The only design element here that implies relationship is proximity. I suppose you could say similarity as well, because they're all the same shapes. We've talked about the NBC logo too. Proximity as well of these feathers to each other, okay? Proximity of the NB and C, they curved very closely to each other. Very similar, very easy to understand. Unilever logo, very much the same principle. There is no U here. This is not the letter U. This is just a series of shapes that are in close proximity to each other, performing or hinting at the shape of this U. This is probably the best example on the page, the Adidas logo. These three separate Adidas stripes are clearly not related to each other. You place them in close proximity, they are clearly related to each other. Very powerful, very simple technique. Let's talk about symmetry then next. Symmetry is very simple. Elements that are identical to each other um, over the fold of a mirror or, or similar. So you can see here, there is some vertical symmetry running down the image of this Starbucks logo. The left is exactly the same as the right. Of course, the opposite is also true. If you have a lack of symmetry, it can imply a lack of a relationship. If you have mostly symmetrical, but with an anomaly, so you see the, the um, parallels here between symmetry and similarity, um, also, a design can have several symmetries. For example, this Nintendo Switch logo. Symmetrical main body shapes of the Joy-Con, similarities in their shapes, anomalies in the positions of the joysticks. Okay? Again, a bit of a gap between this and the logo, so that's proximity. The symmetry of the Nintendo and the Switch, whilst this is... Um, less visually heavy than the switch because there are more letters it evens it out a little bit makes it a bit more symmetrical so here we have a very nice combination of symmetry and asymmet asymmetry working together in order to imply relationships the golden arches don't need to say much about that 100 symmetrical technically two separate arches joined in the middle it is plural golden arches it's not the golden arch um, because they are symmetrical they imply a relationship probably the most famous logo in the world this Pepsi logo has um, typical symptoms of uh, asymmetry and symmetry involved in there as well, okay? As well as closure from this Pepsi logo here. Vertically symmetrical, mostly due to the visual weighting of the red being slightly uh, lighter than the weighting of the blue. You could say that this has vertical symmetry. It also has asymmetry. The visual weighting of this Pepsi logo here is heavier than the rest of this bland uh, red section. And if you don't really understand what I mean when I say visual weight, I recommend looking at my um, basic compositional theory, uh, basics for beginners episode that I've made previously, help understand what that term means. Let's talk about figure and ground then. The final one and probably the most difficult to understand, but indeed the most powerful. The eye, the human eye differentiates um, objects and backgrounds just by its pure nature by perceiving the world we see that when we look at something we try to um, apply a focus to that something you look at um, for a tree for example um, and then the tree sits on a field the tree is clearly the object the field is clearly the background that theory can be applied using figure and ground figure being the object ground being the background okay balancing it is an art form um, but you can break the rules to great effect Take, for example, this Criminal Underworld Batman uh, graphic novel cover. The black section, clearly a silhouette of Batman. However, the yellow, which may be perceived as the ground or background of the image, if reversed, is a silhouette of the penguin, causing the Batman to be the ground and the penguin to be the figure. Very clever. These three examples in the top left use similar um, techniques. The black here on the tree trunk is perceived as the figure. However... 
This section of the black is perceived as the ground. The white here of the river behind the tree clearly perceived as the ground, but the leaves here perceived as the figure. Very intricate, this one. Very good. Could be an emblem of some kind. This blind, very simple. Man's face, silhouetted in the blinds. You look at it the other way, and it is a series of blinds. Very simple. This is probably my favourite one. Really intricate tree. Really cool use of the lion and gorilla here. The only thing I don't like about it are these floating elements. Okay, You could perhaps say that they're supposed to be birds or something, like up here, but they've clearly been added um, as an afterthought because the silhouette edging of this lion or tiger and gorilla um, are just not... Um, apparent enough. I love it. Maybe could have done without this ear, I think. Melbourne Food and Wine Festival, very simple one. Clear, clear figure of a fork, clear figure of three um, bottle bottles of wine, the reverse of which is also true. Okay, the bottles of wine become the recesses in the fork. Two polar bears hugging. Don't need to explain that one very much. The same thing here goes for typography. You do see a lot of figure and ground in typography. It's probably the most interesting gestalt principle, I feel, um, in terms of what you can actually do with it. If you understand this one, you'll have no trouble with any of the others. And as far as gestalt theory goes, um, for a beginner, that's probably all you need to understand. As long as you have a basic understanding of continuation, similarity, closure, proximity, symmetry, figure ground, you'll probably be okay. Um, do feel free to research into this more, though. This is a sort of a black hole of knowledge, um, and it would pay your dues very well to research this. Um, have a Google. Have a look. See if you can come up with some ideas of your own. If you can, let me know. Pop them on the Discord, um, and uh, I'll... I'll, I'll have a look at them. <laughs> I was going to say feedback on them. I'll feedback on them if you want, if you want my feedback. Um, you can get an access to the Discord via the link in the description below. Thank you very much for watching, everybody. I do appreciate it. Um, sorry it's been a while since the last Basics for Beginner episode. They don't get a lot of love, so um, I tend not to do them. But I do enjoy making them. So if you have any theories that you want me to explore, any basic stuff, please let me know in the comments on the Discord, and I'll do my best to create that for you. Thanks very much for watching, everybody, and I'll see you all next time on TipTum. Remember to subscribe for more tips, tricks, and tutorials. Thanks for watching.